Hey everyone, we're so glad that you joined us online this morning. Um, if you're here at the invite of a friend or a neighbor or you just found us somewhere online, welcome. We're so glad that you're with us. If you want to hear a little bit more about who we are, you can head to our website and at the very top there's a contact us link. Hit that and we'll be glad to follow up with you from there. The mission that God has given his church hasn't changed and it won't change, although it feels like its methods are changing minute by minute and hour by hour right now as we continue to hear stories from so many of you who are reaching out to your neighbors in brand new ways in the midst of all this uncertainness. Um, this week we actually heard that one of you is having social distancing gatherings right in your driveway. What an encouragement to your neighbors as they come over, as you guys are six feet apart together in the midst of this. Um, the gospel is being lived out in small acts of kindness and community, and this is just one of those ways. Another way that you can do this actually right now is if you're on Facebook, hit the share button and share this service um, so that all your friends can hear about all that God's doing right now in the midst of all this as well. So today, as we sing, as we pray, as we listen to God's word together, would you remember the one who gives life in the midst of what feels like complete darkness? Good morning, everyone. We're going to sing three songs with you to start, and the first one is called Wind and Waters.
Good morning, New Covenant. Glad you're here with us today. It is the fourth Sunday of Easter. Let's say together, Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let's pray together. O God, whose Son Jesus is the good shepherd of your people, grant that when we hear his voice, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. Hey kids, guess what? It's time for Sunday School Online again. Well, wait till after the service. Grab your parents once the service is over. Go to our website or to our Facebook page, and there you're going to find a brand new lesson. You're going to find a new activity. You're going to find a new worship song. And we want to hear from you about how that went this week. So if you make the activity, if you dance in your living room this week to the worship song, send us a picture. We'd love to hear about it. The gospel reading for this morning is from John chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The Gospel of our Lord. During this time of stay at home, there have been lots of things that we cannot do. Apart from sort of passively watching experts talk about the curve and listening to updates from doctors and local officials, a lot of what we've been doing in place has been waiting. But there have been some trends that have developed in this time, probably because we've spent more time at home than usual. You may not have known that home couture was a thing, even though I have heard from some of you that you've adopted new dress codes for Sunday services. Some other trends or articles I've seen include a push towards do-it-yourself. Maybe you've even been part of some of these trends. Sourdough bread, bootstrapped homeschooling, homemade hand sanitizer, no-sew masks, virtual happy hours, and lots of talk about hair color. Wired Magazine published an article earlier this week by Emma Gray Ellis entitled, Thinking of bleaching your hair or growing a beard? It's not just boredom, it's a coping mechanism. She begins by saying, it's quarantine makeover time. The evidence is all over social media. With hair salons shuttered, people have resorted to chopping at long locks with craft scissors or full-on shaving their heads, dyeing their hair blue or pink with box dye or growing out lumberjack beards. For some, mere hair manipulation isn't enough. If you can keep your eyes open long enough, you could watch YouTube and TikTok videos of people piercing their own ears and noses on their own or letting equally unqualified family members do it for them. Perhaps most adventurous are those contemplating giving themselves quarantine stick and poke tattoos with kits they bought on Facebook. The author goes on to point out that some people are doing this purely out of necessity, others are doing it for more emotional and nebulous reasons. This do-it-yourself trend could be a way to express psychologically, the author says, it can be a sort of declaration of fortitude and hardiness. It's a way of saying, I'm tough. I can withstand adversity. And the urge to change our appearance might also be a desire to change the one thing about our situation that's still within our control, our appearance. Applied to coronavirus, the reasoning could be, since I can't control the virus, I can at least control how I look. 
It could also be a simple way to mark the passage of time. Sometimes these are called quest beards. It's a way to signal that we've somehow crossed a threshold that says, I'm new now. I'm not the way I was. The stakes are also pretty low right now. Whenever the quarantine is lifted, whenever stay at home is passed, we can easily, often, clean up, dress up, and return to normal. While all this talk about uh, do-it-yourself, uh, this is not a brand new thing. There are already some cultural trends that were moving us in the direction, and those things have been accelerated by the current pandemic. Sometimes these limitations are based purely on the fact that, that we don't have access to our normal resources. The people who usually do these things for us are not available. Bakers, theaters, barbers, teachers, these are people who like us. They're people who love their work. They're gifted to do it, but they're not available. And this deficit causes us to think about taking next steps differently. A second reason could also be the opportunity to look again and experiment with a new path. I'm sure innovators will have us completely able to have a touchless world in the next 90 days. Entrepreneurs familiar with a gig economy that's already taught so many younger workers to tackle small projects, to stretch a dollar, and to make the most of their relational network. A pioneer spirit urges us to do and make a way, a rolled up sleeve that says we can do it. This do-it-yourself moment has both serious and amusing consequences, but all these things are taking place in place. In this series, we're looking at essential things that we can do right here and now to make measurable concrete progress while we are in place, in this place. Last week, we saw that what is next is to recognize that the risen Jesus joins us on the journey. His body, once broken but now raised to life evermore, is here to transform and meet us in broken things and lead us to new life. And this week we'll see that the resurrected Jesus has joined us in place to make old things new. So look around you again today and see what and who you see. What has grown weary in these weeks and what was probably worn before this pandemic began but is now definitely showing obvious wear. Remember, the myth is that all real progress takes place outside of our living room, outside of our neighborhood, perhaps even outside of life as we know it. The myth often continues that to make real progress, what's old has to be replaced entirely with what's new. While that might work for part of your closet, it won't work for a real life. There is good news for you today and good news for me. The resurrected Jesus has joined us in place to make old things new. Jesus the Christ, once broken but now alive forevermore, is redeeming, restoring, and renewing. Today we're going to look at two scriptures. In the gospel we heard earlier, the words of Jesus to his friends before Easter have greater power and poignancy because Easter now guarantees their ongoing relevancy. As we read in John 10, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus says that progress isn't inevitable or guaranteed. There are blocked gates, thieves and bandits, and strangers calling. Some come near to lead and guide, others to steal and kill. Proximity and communication are not fail-safes. Every offer for a better life isn't a bona fide offer. Everyone who can identify a worn habit or a point of pain can't necessarily prescribe a cure. There are bandits who see us only as a mark. In contrast, Jesus shows us through Easter that he is truly the gate. He is the good shepherd. He will protect the sheep who know his voice, and he will lead the sheep who follow him, even if initially some of the sheep don't understand exactly what he's saying. He has joined us on the journey. This global promise of Jesus gets applied to our lives in particular and concrete ways. In Acts chapter 2, our second scripture for today, we see a snapshot of this being played out. And I want us to notice how Jesus makes old things new so that his people can live out of the security and strength of his Easter accomplishment. How do we move forward on old rails? In Acts chapter 2, read with me and we'll see the Easter community centered on the crucified and risen Jesus and filled with the spirit that Jesus both promised and poured out. 
Look in verse 32, St. Peter gives this sermon. God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Now he is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father, as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us, just as you see and hear today. Then in verse 36, So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified to be both Lord and Messiah. This was Peter's sermon, and he answered the question of the people who said, What should we do because this is true? Peter summarized by saying, Turn from your old life to Christ. Repent. Join with Christ and the community he is forming. Be baptized, and you will receive forgiveness of sins from the crucified Jesus and the Holy Spirit, Christ's kept promise from heaven. Then Peter goes on to make the most remarkable claims. He says, because the promise is for you and for your children and for as many as the Lord our God will call, generations and nations discipled to Jesus who joins us on this journey until the end of the age. Before we go further, let's make one thing absolutely sure. There are lots of things you can do yourself, but you cannot, I cannot, no one can do it yourself, salvation. None of us can be God. None of us can be Savior. None of us can fuel a life that's transformed by being our own Holy Spirit. This gift must come from outside of us to us. And it does come as a gift. You think a do-it-yourself tattoo might go wrong. Imagine trying to cobble together a life of holiness and fidelity based on what we have in our garages, our past, and our best intentions. Those sorts of things would leave even more and deeper scars. So before we go to concrete ways to make progress in place, let's ask ourselves this fundamental question. What's next for you and me may be to trust Christ full stop. It may be to take a moment and trust our children's health and futures to Christ full stop. It may be to think about your neighbor and all that's going on in their life, all the things that cause you to pray for them and have concerns about them and trust them to Christ, full stop. Self-salvation is snake oil. God has better in store for us. But if you are a follower of Jesus, how do we live as Easter people, forgiven and spirited people in times when weariness makes familiar habits of faith seem flat? How do we make new progress on old tracks? Acts 2 shows us that Jesus had come to make old things new, and it's effective with both longtime saints. Think about the folks gathered on the day of Pentecost. Mother Mary is there, who's been trusting God's promises all of Jesus' life. Close disciples, the 11 who've been with him for several years, and the new converts, over 3,000 who just joined his community in the past several days. What was next for them was God giving them back old habits made new for this new moment. Let's read in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse verse 42. Those who had been baptized devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day after day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord was adding to their number those who were being saved. How does this all come together? Everything the passage describes the disciples of Jesus doing in these early days of the church had precedent in their earlier life. Attention to Scripture and Scripture's teachers, time in community, prayers, meals, festivals, solidarity with those in their circle. These habits were good tools sometimes. Some of your own habits of faith may have seen better days. Some of your own enthusiasm for the role or vocation God has given you may feel paused or sidelined or burdensome in this season. Loving one another may feel irrelevant because you can't see one another or overwhelming because you can only see one another. Jesus gives these familiar habits back to his community now centered on his accomplishment and now fueled by his Holy Spirit. So what is old is no longer primarily about the circumstance or the setting. 
It's no longer fueled mostly by customer social expectation. It's no longer centered on a particular place like the temple or on an existing community group like a family or tribe. Paul gives us the mechanics of this in Ephesians 4 when he describes that the goal of the church and its leaders is not to provide all religious services to its members, but instead to equip the friends of Jesus to do the work God has graced them to do. How does this occur? By pointing all the friends of Jesus to the accomplishment of Jesus and recognize his goal for unity in all things by living in the spirit he has poured out. This is far better than do it yourself. It's do it together. Not as independence, but as maturity. Not as growing in self-reliance, but growing in strength and grace. Easter renews these habits of faith in ways that enlarge the lives of those who live them and enlarges the community of those who share them. Let's see how. Let's think about the apostles' teaching. The apostles' teaching improved because Jesus now moves the story of a prophesied fulfillment in the future to something that's available to live in here and now. And let's think honestly about the apostles themselves, some of their earlier teachings. You remember some of the early teaching of the apostles. Let's send the hungry away to find food for themselves. Let's keep these troublesome children away from Jesus. Let's call down fire on those who aren't already part of our group. And now you hear in the words of St. Peter, the promise of the crucified and spirit-giving Jesus is for you and for your children and to as many as the Lord our God will call. Making progress in place for us can include devoting ourselves to the apostles' teaching, recognizing that Jesus has made the scriptures not just something to describe the life then and there, but life for here and now. To hear in every passage of Scripture the crucified and spirit-giving Jesus calling out to us to draw closer to Him and to one another, to experience God's resurrection life in life where we live it. On your couch, at your table, in your car, with your neighbor, with your kid, with your enemy, until all have heard the good news. This act of guidance for changed hearts comes not just from the apostles themselves, but from those who have embraced the apostles' message, brothers and sisters who also know and love Jesus. Let's think about fellowship. This is so hard right now, but so many of you have come up with very creative workarounds. While you can't gather from place to place, so many of you are gathering by telephone, by Zoom calls, uh, Check, texting to one another at the bottom of our online service, uh, sending cards and letters, meeting in your driveway, much time together in many settings, whether the temple or from house to house, not just common spaces, but common hearts. This fellowship is now bigger, including more people, not just Jew, also Gentile, eventually including every tribe and nation. And the fellowship endures whether all the people hold the people of God in goodwill or antagonism. This is durable community that isn't shaken by circumstance. Think about prayer, and this is a big one. The prayers of the friends of Jesus have been shaped and offered in his name. This affects both the moments and the patterns of prayer, spontaneous prayers and planned prayers. The authority of Jesus has been given to those who are learning to see the world as he does, and they join him from God's right hand in asking God to change the world they're living in. Not one day in promise, but in response to the fulfillment of Jesus. As one person has said, prayer is rebellion against the status quo. Here's one takeaway. Last week I gave you two questions to take to your prayers. This week I give you just one. Jesus, what are we going to do about this? Jesus is present and active, crowned with authority and sending forth the Spirit to change you and to change the world. Prayer extends the reach of God's people to places they cannot physically be and extends the power of God to accomplish things that we couldn't do even if we were on site. Here's the last one. It's the most revolutionary and it's been the most painful in these days. The breaking of bread. One, Jesus expands an annual meal of remembering and hope into a regular meal of renewal and strength. The broken bread reminds followers of Jesus at every table to give thanks, that is, to make Eucharist, and also to see every meal, whether liturgical or not, as an opportunity to share 
envision reconciliation, and bring those formerly excluded from God's fellowship closer to him. The tables in our homes and at restaurants, eventually, are meant to be places of grateful and generous hearts. For all who welcome Christ's work, they should find a place in his Eucharistic assembly. And for all those who are exploring the claims of Christ or coming to know who Christ is and what he offers to us, they should find at the table of every believer a table that is set with bread broken to share and a hope of bringing reconciliation to those formerly estranged. I have to be honest with you, I cannot wait to break bread again with you all. So today, if you're weary in the habits of your faith or have found them worn down by the separation from our community, take heart. Jesus wants to renew you in them by focusing your attention on him. Look for him in the scriptures and in the broken bread. Offer prayers to your friend who sits in high places and cultivate fellowship with others who love him or are learning to love him. And if you're in your, weary in your calling, take heart. Offer that work that you've done in his name, whether in exhausted success or flaming failure, to him knowing that it's only his perfect righteousness that sanctifies the work of our hands. Take a breath. He's with us to the end of the age. He is the good shepherd. Do it yourself has its blessings and it has its limitations. With Christ, let's travel old paths with new strength. His strength with you and for you. So go ahead and cut your hair, dye your hair, grow a beard, Change your style, but also look for Christ to be working to build character in you that will endure, not just through this season, but for a lifetime. We can make progress in place. Amen. Over the last couple of weeks, we're seeing that Jesus joins us on the journey. And every practice, every custom, every habit that we adopt only will work in bringing about lasting change if Christ is there with us by his Spirit. I want to invite you as we prepare to confess our faith, to offer our prayers, and to confess our sins, to notice how central Jesus is to all three of these moments. It's only Jesus who reveals to us not only his character and his work for us on the cross, but he reveals to us our Father who is the Creator, and he opens to us the community that is the church and the offer of the life to come. In our prayers, we're not left to try to impress God with our own deservings or to persuade God with our special pleadings, but we're taught by Jesus himself to call out to our Father who is in heaven. And when we confess our sins, we have confidence that we can be as honest as we need to be, more honest than we dare to be on our own, because Jesus has offered us mercy and forgiveness. I invite you to confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray together in the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I want you to take a moment and in the quiet of your heart to review the week that you've lived before God and neighbor. 
and to confess your sins against God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This week, remember that Jesus has joined us on our journey. And because he has died once for all and been raised to life everlasting, he has come by his Spirit to make old things new. So may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia.